So this notion that if you build incineration, you get rid of landfills, you don't get rid of landfills, you still have landfills for the toxic ash. Next. And you also put highly toxic substances into the air. Next. Uh, including toxic metals like lead, cadmium, mercury, arsenic, chromium. Next. And in the process of burning, we produce very, very toxic substances. Thousands, thousands of toxic byproducts. And these toxic metals and these new compounds come out next as nanoparticles. Very tiny particles. Next. And here's the problem for us in the community, because incinerators are regulated at 10 microns, 10 microns, are cannonballs compared to little, tiny nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles are not being measured and they're not being regulated from incinerators. Next. Now, nanoparticles are not efficiently captured by even modern air pollution control devices. And the pro the, this is the serious problem. They're so tiny, they're so tiny they can go straight through the lung membranes into the blood. So we breathe the air into our bloodstream. Next, once they're in next, once they're into the bloodstream next, they are circulated around the body and they can enter every tissue in the body, including the brain. Now this is a particle in the brain which contains lead, barium, chromium, iron, and silicon. And we're only just beginning to understand this problem. Just in the last few years, we're beginning to understand these problems. Next. Now, Dr. Professor Vivian Howard in England presented a very thorough 30-page review of this issue at a hearing in Ireland. And I have a copy of this on my laptop. I can send it to anybody that's interested. And, uh, and you can have it tonight if you have a, a pen drive, thumb drive. But next, there's been no scientific response to this statement from Vivian Howard. None. None from industry, none from the government. And it illustrates, it illustrates very, care, very well a problem with incineration. If you don't look, you don't find. So if there's, a, there's an issue which is not being measured and not being regulated as far as the public is concerned or as far as the experts are concerned there is no risk there's no risk because we don't measure it and of course this is ridiculous it serves the interests of the corporations that build incinerators but it doesn't serve the interests of you, your family or your children Next. There are better alternatives to incineration and mega -lanthers. Next. The modern incinerator is attempting to perfect a bad idea. Our task in the 21st century is not to get to find better ways to destroy discarded materials, but to stop making packaging and products that have to be destroyed. And that is the heart of the zero waste message. Don't find better ways to get rid of this stuff. The residuals, the leftovers. Start making it if we want a future for our children. Next. So the waste problem will not be solved with better technology, but with better organization, better education, and better industrial design. And so that brings us next to the zero waste
2020 strategy. Now, I had the opportunity to give this presentation at the United Nations in New York City uh, to the United Nations Commission for Sustainable Development. So this zero waste message has gone around the world already. Next, and what was nice is they invited me back in May to give it, to give it again. So obviously some uh, of these representatives of your countries were excited by this message. <clears throat> now the place I've been to most is Italy. I've been to Italy now, I think, 54 times. And I've spoken in 224 different cities in Italy. And as a result of this, and uh, uh, Patricia, Patricia, will you stand up, please? Because uh, <coughs> she is the co-author with Rosana Mercolini, who will be in here tomorrow. Um, next. So here's myself. This is Rosano Galini uh, and Patricia Lasciotto. Rosano is from Capalmeri. Patricia is from Trapani in, in Sicily. And between them, they have done fantastic work to make uh, the zero waste movement happen in Italy. Next. So zero waste is a new direction. We have to move from the back end of waste management to the front end of better industrial design. Next. We need three things to get to zero waste. We need industrial responsibility at the front end, we need community responsibility at the back end, and we need good political leadership to bring those two together. And isn't it exciting to be in San Sebastian and Onani and um, uh, Subiru with good political leadership. Here you have leaders who had the courage to go zero waste long before many other communities in Spain had the, the willingness to do that. Hopefully, San Sebastian will follow the leads of Anani and uh, Asubi. Next. So I'm going to talk about the 10 steps to zero waste. First step, source separation. Next, these are the magic machines, not the incinerators, these things. We all have these 10 things. And these 10 things can make waste by mixing everything together, but they can save resources. They can save resources if they're educated. Next, door-to-door -door collection. Uh, in San Francisco, it looks like that. Once a week, there are three containers. One for all the recyclables, one for the compostables, and one for the residual fraction. But in Italy, they have a better system. In Capavari, in Italy, they have four different, uh, different um, materials selections. <coughs> Next. And the same trucks on different days pick up different materials. So on Mondays, the trucks pick up the organic waste. On Tuesdays, the same trucks pick up the multi, the mix of the, the recyclable materials. On Wednesday, they pick up the paper. And Anani and Asubio have gone better. Next. Yes, I shared these slides all over the world. In Colombia, in Serbia, in England, in Wales, in uh, America, in Canada, these slides. Okay, next. So you know where you are? You're here somewhere? Next. And here's the same back, 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 back. back. <laughs> okay, okay. Next. So the four different materials, the, 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 um, the plastics, the paper, is it paper products? Plastics, uh, the residuals, uh, the, the organics, and the residual fraction. Next, and they're picked up on different days. Notice that three, three days they picked up the organic fraction. Next, and this, I've been doing this for 27 years, and I've been to 55.
65 countries, and this is a, the most creative thing I see for the collection of, of separated materials. Look at it, just a hook. Everybody has a number. Everybody has a hook. And that is where you put the separated materials. Next. And there they are. Look, they put the organic fraction. Everybody's put the organic fraction there on this it must have been a uh, Wednesday or Monday. And next. And these are also inside people's houses or on, on posts. And we today, for the first time for me, we saw these in person today in Anani and in uh, uh, Sabine. Next. Here they are again. Again. Wonderful. And this is so important. It's so important because if you want to compost the organics in the waste, you've got to get them clean. You've got to get them clean. And the only way you can get clean organics is door-to-door -door collection. And this is the best way to get clean organics, the system I talked about. Next. And this is the, this is the composting facility in San Francisco. Uh, it's surrounded by farmland. Next. And the farmers are using the compost to grow fruit and vegetables which go back to San Francisco. Next. 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 Look at this. This is from Hanani. This is how good their system is. 99.76% cure. You're doing very well if you can get 95% cure with curbside collection. To get 99.76% means that Hanani is leading the world. Number one in the world for getting clean organics for compost. This is most exciting, and you deserve applause. <laughs> Next, we must involve restaurant owners and farmers in zero waste. The worst thing that we can do is to say, we have waste experts. Uh, we have Dr. Connick, we have Enzo Fabrino, we have this gentleman, we have Patricia. No, 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 no. We all have to be waste experts. We all have to be involved in this. And really important are restaurant owners and farmers in making sure we have a successful zero waste program. We have to involve them in our discussion. We want the farmers to use this compost to grow their food. And if we produce rubbish, junk, they're not going to use it. So we've got to make sure that they are involved in this process. Next, recycling. We need a materials recovery facility. Next, this is the facility in San Francisco. You can see San Francisco in the background there. I am hoping that we'll see this, a similar facility in Naples. In many respects, Naples looks a little bit like San Francisco. Naples in Italy. Remember Naples? Wow. Okay, here's the, the materials that are being recovered. Next. And this is the system, I believe this is an Hanani, where you see the separated materials on a smaller scale in San Francisco, but doing a very good job. Reuse, repair, and deconstruction. I love reuse. Next. Reusable items are only a small fraction of the total. 2%. This is in Los Angeles. 2% of the, of the total. Small fraction. But look at the value. Look at the value of those reusable items. Well over a third of the total value. What does that mean? That means there are jobs and businesses waiting to happen if you recapture the reusable object. The next, here is a place where they are in, in Berkeley, California, where they are recapturing those reusable objects. 
next. Next. And this gentleman and his wife, Dan and Nat, they've been doing this for 30 years. 30 years. Next. And they're grossing $3 million a year handling these materials, selling these materials back to the public. And 27 full time, well paid jobs doing this. So I'm not sure what San Sebastian has here, but this is what you need. And here are the people, look, they've, they've gone and bought furniture, appliances, clothing, you name it. Next. And you want a toilet bowl? Go to Berkeley. And you want a door? This is porter, a porter, a porter, a porter, a porter, a porter, a porter. <laughs> Next. We need to involve builders and architects in zero waste. We need people to use these secondary materials. And we need businesses now to, to capture these materials. This is a Recycle North in Burlington, Vermont. And if you go into the store, it's like a, a second hand, it's beautiful. It's like a big uh, you know, chain store it's with appliances and and furniture and working television sets. It's lovely, but all reused, all second hand. Next, have bicycles, books, bolts, bric a brac, everything you can think of. Next, and then they're, they're training people. They're training people. They're training people to repair large appliances, small appliances, electrical goods. Computers. So they're taking people off the street and showing them how to repair things. And after six months, they get a certificate and they help them to get a job. Next, and, and here's the deconstruction. Taking down the buildings in the reverse uh, direction from what they were put up. And then the, the lumber that's pulled out is made available and then people can use this wood to make uh, new products. It's very, very popular indeed. Next. So reuse and repair centers can be used to, for poverty relief, job creation, job training, community development, very important, and link to deconstruction and other small business opportunities. So that's reuse, repair, and deconstruction. Next. Next, and uh, you can see some of these operations on videotape. If you go to my website here, AmericanHealthStudies.org, and you click on videos, you can see next uh, videotapes, many examples of reuse and repair around the world. Next. So, we've only covered five of the ten steps. How far can we get? Well, let's start with San Francisco. San Francisco, population 850,000, very little space. 50% um, of the waste was diverted by 2000, 63% by 2004, 70% by 2008, 72% by 2009, 75% diverted by 2010, and now we're up to 78% diverted 2011, and the goal is zero waste by 2020. And they are determined. So if a city like San Francisco could do this, surely San Sebastian can do this too. It's certainly more difficult to do this in uh, San Francisco than it would be to do it in San Sebastian. Because they have many different languages, <coughs> different cultural groups to deal with, and so on. Next, in Italy, we have over 200 communities getting more than 70% diversion, and some very quickly. Uh, next, Novara is a city near Turin of 100,000, 70% diversion in just 18 months. And Salerno, now this is nearly the same size as San Sebastian, 145,000. They went from 18% to 72% in one year. So, if, again, if San Sebastian wants to go to Salerno and see what they're doing there, it's a very good example. Next. And we
we have many communities now uh, in Italy have declared a zero waste strategy and number the next one, next slide, and Naples. By October the 23rd, 2011, the mayor of, of Naples declared zero waste. So Naples has the potential, it isn't there yet, it has the potential of being the city with the worst waste management in the world, moving towards an example of the best waste management in the world. This is very exciting in Italy. Next. So, where are we? Five, five steps. We've composted, we've recycled, we've reused, repaired, etc. Ah, but we still have this residual fraction. That's why we need to build an incinerator, yes? Yes, an incinerator now? No! Let me hear you. No! Incinerate down! No! Yes. No! We have more to do. Okay, next. Step six. We have to minimize this residual fraction with waste reduction initiatives. Examples. In Ireland. Next. The government put a 15 cent tax on plastic shopping bags and to everybody's amazement they reduced the use of these bags by 92% in one year. Incredible. Next, in Italy, some supermarkets allow you to refill shampoo and detergent bottles. And in this place, in Capanari, you can refill, you can get your milk from a machine. And I saw the same machine in Hanani today. Anani, so you're, you're doing this, it's wonderful. Next, but have you got every quarter? Every quarter, next, has 60 taps. 60 taps for detergents, shampoos, taps for everything. Next, we have a tax for, for detergents. Next, we have taps for olive oil. And next, ah, we have taps for vino rosso. Rosso. Vino Ross, Vino Tinto, Vino Bianco, because you just get your glass here, and you uh, take that, very, very good, and then you take this one, and you take this one, and you take and you take This is my favorite place in the whole world, is every quarter in Capanri. Next, and no plastic. No plastic. If you don't have your own shopping bag, you can get one made of jute or one made of cotton. And also, next, this, these are Rossano Alcalini's children. He's a primary school teacher. When he's not organizing zero waste in Italy, the Garibaldi of zero waste in Italy, Rossano Alcalini, he's organizing his primary school children tap water, not bottled water, glass, not plastic, china, not plastic, stainless steel, not plastic. And that's what we need in every school, in every university, in every institution. Get rid of that plastic. We don't need that plastic. We need plates and knives and forks and glass and china. And we need people to wash them up. We want jobs. We want the jobs washing those up. Next, we must involve our children in zero waste from the very beginning. We must involve our babies in zero waste. A Here we are. This is a zero waste baby. Zero waste baby. Reusable family. Reusable diaper. Reusable nap. Next, step seven, economic incentives. Money works. So, in this system, the compostables are free, the recyclables are free, but the residual fraction, the more you make, the more you pay. Uh, and that is very effective. Next, in Italy, this town of Villa Franca d'Asti, population of 3,000, went from 70% to 85% diversion 
in one, very quickly, once they introduce this pay by bag system. And then, are you ready for it? In Spain, Acevedo, in Basque Country, went from 28% to 86% in seven months using door-to-door -door collection and the pay-by-bag system. They called it the Italian method. Step eight. Next. Step eight is the most important step to get close to zero waste. It completely avoids incineration. It makes the residual fraction very visible. Think about it. Incinerators are useful to make the residual fraction disappear. That's what they do. They make it disappear. We don't want the residual fraction to disappear. We want to see it because this residual fraction is our mistakes. Bad industrial design. Bad purchasing habits. Don't make it disappear. Make it visible. We want discipline here. This is democratic discipline. Make it visible. And so, this step eight brings community responsibility face to face with industrial responsibility. And we do this in the residual separation and research facility. And this next this is built in front of the landfill. Next. And no material can go directly into the landfill. It must go through this facility. More material can be recycled. More toxics can be removed. And the dirty organic fraction can be biologically stabilized above ground before it causes problems underground. And then finally, the non recyclable materials can be studied. Next. This is operating, or most of it is operating in Nova Scotia. Long conveyor belts, they're pulling out the non-recyclables, the more recyclables are pulling out the toxics, and the dirty organic fraction, the, the nappies, the diapers, get all the way to the end of the conveyor belt when they're shredded and go through a second composting operation to stabilize the material above ground before it causes problems underground, before it creates leachate, before it creates methane. You stabilize it above ground. Now into this, we need to make an addition. Next, we need to put in a research center to study the non-recyclable fraction. Next. And we need the local university or technical college, professors and students, to study our mistakes as part of the movement towards sustainability. This can be the laboratory for sustainability for our universities. This again is discipline. This is discipline. Don't just talk, 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 and write papers. Get your hands dirty. Go and look at our problems. Look at what we're doing. We need to get those professors and students out of the university and into the communities and helping us with real problems, especially the problem that threatens life as we know it on this planet. We need their help. Sustainability is the biggest problem after war that we face. I did most. <laughs> Most professors and students are oblivious of the world. It's not sustainable, no problem, no problem. We'll get another planet to go to. Will we? Will we get another planet to go to? I don't think so. Okay. So we must involve our professors and students in zero waste. Next. And the message to industry, slow down here. If we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it or compost it, this is what Hanani, Hanani and uh, Ursabil need to be saying to industry right now because they're up to 80, nearly 90%. They need to say, if we can't reuse it, 
If we can't recycle it, we can't compost it, we're doing very well. We're over 80, making nearly 90% conversion. Industry next shouldn't be making it. We need better industrial design for the 21st century. We can't get to zero waste alone. We can't do it all in our communities. We're going to need the help of industry to get to zero. Next. Now, <clears throat> we have two models here. This is for the residuals. One model is the incinerator plus a toxic ash lamp. And the other model I just, just described is a residual separation facility plus a zero waste research center with an interim landfill with a stabilized dirty organic fraction next. And this research center is feedback for waste reduction and better industrial design to industry. Which, which is more likely to take us to a sustainable future? The top one or the bottom? It seems to me this is where the future is. This is our way to the future. Better industrial design then is step number nine and step number ten, an interim landfill for biologically stabilized dirty organic fraction. Next. So I reckon it's reasonable to get 70 to 80 percent diversion from community responsibility, but the last 20 or 30 percent has to come from industry. Next. 20 to 30 percent from industrial responsibility. That's our root map. Next. And industrial responsibility we need to design for sustainability from the word go. Next, we need clean production, stop using many toxic substances. And thirdly, we need extended producer responsibility. If you make a product in the future, expect to get it back. Expect to get it back after the customer has finished with it. And that's what we have. So the summary of these 10 steps to zero waste, here we are. There are those 10 steps. Source separation, door-to-door -door collection, composting, recycling. You've got the first four steps there. Now you need five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Next, you notice that it begins with everybody. Everybody's 10 fingers. But notice where it ends. It ends with the research center and an industry. So we start with these, which everybody has, and we end with the brightest minds in our universities and in industry to solve this problem. Next, this 10 step plan is low tech. All these facilities can be built locally. Uh, it creates many jobs and business opportunities. It is positive and brings people together. Incinerate, incinerators divide the community, make the politicians and the citizens into enemies. But zero waste brings them together. It integrates higher education into the solution, professors and students. It offers more hope to our children about the future. Now let me, I think this is probably the most important thing. Every day, we are telling our children that there's no future for them. There's global warming. There's ozone damage. We're losing rainforests. We're losing species. We're filling the oceans with plastic. We're filling our bodies with, with toxins. We're running out of resources. This is a very depressing message to a young person to be told, you have no future. I wasn't told that when I was 12, when I was 13 and 14. I wasn't brought up in a world where they told me, Paul, you have no future. But that's what we're telling our kids every day on television. 
you have no future. But I believe that with this lonely beginning with zero waste, this lonely beginning with the stuff that we all make and the ten steps which begin at the very bottom and work towards the very top will give us hope for the future. Next. So the conclusions here. We don't need mega landfills or incinerators. There is a better alternative. <clears throat> this is the zero waste strategy. It's better for our health, less toxic, nanoparticles, toxic air, no. <clears throat> better for the economy, more jobs. It's better for our universities, more meaning. It's better for our children, more hope. And it's better for our planet, more sustainable. And I think in the interest of time, that is where I will stop. And I entertain uh, questions from anybody.
So if you have no money in Burlington, Vermont, you have nothing. Maybe you've just come out of prison. Maybe you're a refugee. You have nothing. You go to social services. They will give you coupons. And you can take those coupons to recycle them and get the basic furniture that you need. Not the luxury items, but the, the tables, the chairs, the refrigerators, the stoves, and so on. So, uh, yeah, you can even have both for profit or for not for profit. Good question. There's one on that.
the, the way I'm most familiar with this is the retailer. The retailer, when he sells you or she sells you a computer, is anticipating that that computer, the old computer, is going to come back to them. And then they have to get that back to the manufacturer. So it's a retailer. And I think what we're going to see here, which is, um, which is uh, can link with reuse, we're going to see some corporations doing the reuse. So taking, so here you have this company that's making new copying machines, and the same company will be disassembling old copying machines and using the parts, recycling the materials. <clears throat> so expect that, but expect some companies to um, franchise this out, to say, okay, this is what we want to do. We have a company over here, X, which is good at this stuff, and they will do the, the dismantling of these machines for us. So they will get a contract from, from Sony, from Fuji, from whatever the company is, and they will do the dismantling. So either way, we're going to get jobs, and hopefully we're going to get more sustainable activity. These are good questions, yes? to get clean organics that we 
we can use. And you're doing it better than anywhere in the world. Anani, you're doing it better than anywhere in the world. This is great. You should be so pleased. <clears throat> Am I using up? What's the time like here? Are we okay, 10 past 8? You tell me when you've got to stop. I have to switch from this white stuff to uh, red stuff soon. Okay, let's turn it on. Here we go. Mike, I'm going to tell you about this. I'm going to tell you about this. Eh, 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 eh,
kuin sen eläinten kanssa täällä isän oso seata, vai alde vaatetik esan da burutasuna alde emaitza bueno, emaitza una lontzeko beharrezkoa dela olako kontrola atez adekuan en bidez egiten da nian lortzen dan kontrol hori baina kontua dan ez da bakarri kontrola bezik eta hemen bozarri kontuan bozarri edukintziaren bidez egiten da nian badago buruguntasun aldetik maitza honak zehatikan hemen egiten da giltza batek iristen da kontena gai edo ari ditzik ere eta kontua arazoa da horretan ezko sistema dala eta hori emaitza kantitate aldetik oso mugentzak ehal nahiko testimoniala ezaten dela ez dakit beste tokitan olako aldak eta gindean on neutin diran, baina hemen nahiko argi dago zertan dantzan izaren zirat ja, in terms of getting things to happen affecting change I I learnt after 27 years of doing doing this I've had to learn some humility. I cannot stop incinerating. I cannot make zero waste programs. But what I realized is that affecting change is like driving a nail through a piece of wood. The expert, Enzo, me, some others, Patricia, we sharpen the nail. With our information, with our experience, we sharpen the nail, but we can't push the nail through the piece of wood. You need the hammer of public opinion to drive that nail home. So we are only as good as you are if, if we don't say the things which make you want this change, make you want not to have an incinerator, make you want to have zero waste, then we failed. Because you have to do it. But we cannot change just my talking to the mayor. There may be the rear mayor who will listen, but that's not enough. The mayor needs to see that hundreds of thousands of people want this, want it badly. Then you can get the change. And I always end my presentations with three messages. First message is to activists. No, it's to citizens, right? The first message is to citizens. Don't let the experts take your common sense away. They will try to make you that dioxins are safe enough to have on your cornflakes. Now, you have to have confidence in your own Wisdom. Don't let the experts take your common sense away. That's the first thing. The second message is to politicians. Put your faith back in people. Stop running to magic machines and high-paid consultants. We won't let you down. The people will not let you down if you explain to them that this solution is the best solution for their children and their grandchildren. Most of the people I talk to are come to these meetings because they're concerned about their children and their grandchildren and their community. And if, if we can get the solutions which appeal to that, we can win. And the third message is to act on this. Are you ready for this one? Are you an activist? In America, we have to apologize for being an activist. Well, I'm very, very sorry for being an activist. I'm very sorry. It's very, very well. I'm allowed to think anything. <laughs> you see, see what happens? You never say anything you want. You don't do anything you want. But the moment, the moment you do something about it, then you're a suspect. You're an activist. You're an activist. No, the, the message for activists is to have fun. You don't enjoy this. If you don't enjoy
enjoy saving the planet, don't do it. Don't do it. You've got to enjoy it. You've got to find a way of enjoying it. And, and quite frankly, the way I've enjoyed it for 27 years, uh, and I say this every time I remember, is I just love the people that I'm working with in 55 different countries. They're all the same. All over the world, it's the same people, different colors, speaking different languages, but the same audiences come to these meetings. They're the best people in the world. And the, the, the beauty today is that we have internet, and we can talk to each other across the whole planet. So we may only be a few people, you know, in our towns, in our countries, we may be a few people, but over the whole planet, there's a huge grassroots movement for good. A new politics, I would say a new politics, very, very, very uh, visible in Italy. Italy, the politicians talk, 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 about nothing, but they talk, and they get elected. And, but this, there's a new movement in Italy, it's the politics of concrete action. It's, it's things are being done in communities, and it's working its way up, up. And, and zero waste is part of this empowering people to make changes in their local communities. It's a, it's a new politics. It's very, very exciting. And as I say, this, you're all part of that. Very, very exciting indeed. Bueno, como digo usted, no ha conseguido poner un capítulo de la escala que manas para.